came here from the University of Berkeley, California, and his name is Gabriel Gomez, and today he present us his interesting talk, which all optimization programs in traffic control. So we have please Earl. Thank you, Yaroslav, and thank you all for coming today. Um, I know that uh, it is nice and warm outside, and, and it's very tempting to be out in nature and having a good time. So this is true dedication to be here today, so I thank you. Um, yes, I, I met uh, Yaroslav in Berkeley when he was visiting, and uh, he gave a very nice talk to my group um, and said, well, why don't you come to Russia? And I said, okay, I'm coming next month. <laughs> so this doesn't usually work out, but this time it worked out, and so now I'm here, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, when, when, he, when I started thinking about uh, a talk, um, what I tried to think about is, you know, what is some sort of, oh, by the way, uh, um, I, I know that I'm not speaking in your native language, so if I, if you, please interrupt me if you don't, if I, I'm not clear, um, and please interrupt as much as you want. But um, I tried to think of some uh, overarching theme, uh, you know, some, some sort of theme for the talk, and it didn't quite work out, but the, the theme that I thought about was a relaxation. Uh, so many problems that I, I've worked on over the past few years, uh, optimization problems and traffic control, they start out as difficult problems, and then uh, you say, okay, let's relax the problem. And this has turned out to be a fruitful technique. And, and I don't know if it's a theme, but it's an observation that, um, that uh, this sometimes works. So. So this is the outline of the talk. Um, there are two parts. Uh, first, I'll talk about the problem of ramp metering on congested freeways and go into the model that we use, which is called the ACTM, formulate this optimization problem, and then see how we can find a solution via a relaxation. Um, the next problem is signal coordination on streets. Uh, here, the approach is different, the model is different, the thing that we optimize is different, and it's called bandwidth, and we'll talk about that. Um, the basic formulation is a two-path uh, formulation. Um, again, there's a solution via relaxation, and I'll provide some extensions to the basic problem. The extensions are Gaussian arrival functions, von Mises arrival functions, and networks. And this is, this is very recent work, in fact, the the paper on this I uh, just was uh, was issued uh, an issue number. Um, I just saw it in my email yesterday. So this is it, this is just recently published in IEEE transactions on ITS, and these are um, extensions that are being published right now. Actually, in some cases before the basic paper. So this is brand new. This is very good. This is from my dissertation. Um, so part one, ramp metering for congested freeways. So here's a freeway, right? Um, it's sort of a linear freeway. Uh, it has ramps, on ramps, and off ramps. Um, I'm going to say that this freeway has some traffic sensors, let's say, on the main line. And those traffic sensors are sufficient for me, they give me density, speed, flow, and there's sufficient information for me to come up with some pretty good estimate of the state of traffic. Um, so I have sensors on the main line, sensors on the ramps that give me how many people are getting on and off. And on some, perhaps not all of the on-ramps, I have some metering lights. Okay, so that's the setup. And of course I have some congestion. 
Now here's the question. Um, by metering these ramps, is it possible to decrease the total congestion on the freeway and the main line, or does metering amount to simply transferring congestion from here to here without decreasing the total? Right? And so this is the question. Um, and I've already given the answer. Yes, it is a good idea to meter um, because you can decrease the total by metering. Okay, so that's the short answer is yes. Um, uh, a slightly longer answer is that, well, why is this true? Uh, it's true because there are certain inefficiencies associated with keeping congestion on the freeway. What are these inefficiencies? Uh, first of all, uh, you block the off-ramps. This congestion is not allowing people to get off. So if I put this congestion here, then I wouldn't have that, that inefficiency. Um, vehicles have finite acceleration. So if I stop, if these vehicles are stopped, then they accelerate, so the flow coming out of here is smaller than it would be if there were no congestion. We call that capacity drop. The capacity drops due to congestion. This is another inefficiency of having congestion on the main line. Third, weaving. Uh, vehicles in congestion tend to change lanes a lot, and that lane changing is inefficient. So, in fact, putting more of the congestion on the ramps is it can decrease the total congestion because you avoid these inefficiencies. Okay? Um, now, I'm going to employ a first order theory, and that first order theory does not model these two, does not, in, in the first order theory you can have infinite acceleration, in the first order theory there is no modeling of weaving or anything like that in, in the theory that I use. So the first order theory only captures this inefficiency. Okay? Um, and, and yet, so we'll optimize only to eliminate off-ramp blockage. Okay. <coughs> so what is the first order model? We call it the ACTM. Um, are, are, are people here aware of, let's say, the Lighthill with the Richards model? This is the continuous um, theory uh, that um, is basically a, a first order PDE, a nonlinear wave of, uh, a model. Um, from here, there, there is a uh, discretization of this um, that follows a Godunov scheme, and we get the cell transmission model. This is a, a, a commonly used um, uh, discrete version of the light bulb with them. Now, this applies to networks in general. Um, and if we try to optimize this, it's a little, it's difficult. So what we did was we made some simplifications to this that uh, by assuming that we're only going to apply it to our freeways and we get what we call the asymmetric cell, cell transmission model which we will see uh, has nice properties for optimization. So here I'm going to explain what the asymmetric cell transmission model is. Um, okay, first we are going to divide the freeway into segments. Okay, a segment, let's say the i segment, will have these things. We'll have um, uh, n i k denotes the number of vehicles in the segment. Um, then you have an on ramp. You may have one on ramp and or one off ramp. Uh, the, there will be l i k vehicles, l i at time k vehicles in the on ramp waiting to get on in a queue. That queue is supplied by an uncontrolled demand D. Uh, the flow from the queue into the seg into the main line is R. I'm going to apply a, a metering rate C. Okay. The flow from here to the off ramp I call S, and the flow between the segments on the main line I call F. Okay. So how we have two densities L and N. 
two flows, R and F, demand, uh, oh, and S, sorry, three flows, R, F, and S, and then uh, control C, okay? Now, um, I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with uh, the flow density relationship, which if you take one of these sensors and you measure density and you measure flow, it tends to fall on a, a shape somewhat like this, right? And this shape uh, is called the fundamental diagram. Um, and you can fit it, uh, it's often fit with this sort of uh, piecewise linear uh, curve. Uh, and so that, that's what I'm going to assume, and I'll call this slope, the free flow speed V, the, the largest capacity, the largest flow that you can ever measure, that you measure, it is F bar, I call it, that's the capacity. Um, the most vehicles that fit into the segment, uh, uh, so that's the number of vehicles that are in the segment when it com com becomes completely full, is N bar, this is the jam density, and this W is the congestion wave speed. Uh, these are normalized quantities, so W and V will fall between 0 and 1. Okay, is, uh, is everything good so far? Okay. Um, so, now the off ramp flows, this is the model for the off ramp flows, is that the off ramp flows are some given portion beta of the total flow that exits the segment, okay? And this beta is a portion that's between zero and one and it's given, okay? And then these are the rest of the equations of the model. This completes the model. Uh, first, let's say we calculate the on-ramp flows. And these, these equations will be familiar to you if you've worked with the cell transmission model. They're very similar to the cell transmission model but they're a little tweaked. Um, so, we have to compute the ramp flow from the on-ramp to, uh, uh, to the freeway, we take the minimum of what can be sent. What can be sent is everybody who's here plus the demand. Uh, it can also not exceed what can be the space that's available here, which is the total number of vehicles that can go in minus what is there already, so this is the total space available in, in the segment, and only uh, an allocation C is provided to the on-ramp, okay? And it also cannot exceed the ramp metering rate, okay? Um, a similar, uh, uh, analogous equation applies to the mainline flows. So what can be sent from one segment to the next this F cannot exceed uh, what can be sent in free flow. So all of the vehicles that are here, we take a portion to discount the vehicles that are going to go this way. So that's one minus beta, and and this portion it, uh, is proportional to the free flow speed. What goes this way? Um, uh, what can be accepted is a portion W of the total space. So you can see here that something like this, this wi plus one plus this c should be smaller than one, so you so that n never gets bigger than n bar, um, and then the capacity. Okay. We assume that off ramps have large enough capacity. Yes. 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 Um, although not necessarily. Uh, one could insert a, a capacity here, up here, that would be something like the off-ramp capacity divided by beta or something like that. And, and so that, that would appear. Um, and then, it, so once with these computed, we do a very simple uh, conservation equation to update the next uh, time for the densities uh, on the on-ramp and on the mainline. Very simple model. Now, uh, the um, our measure of goodness is going to be the total travel time. So we want to minimize the total travel time. Uh, that is the time spent by all vehicles in the system. 
and that will be proportional to if we add over time and space all the vehicles in the system. Okay, so essentially we have this given demand D that is um, filling the system, and we want to get people out as quickly as possible. This is for stationary regime, or uh, for some period, a large period of time. The, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, this is the period of time. Ah. Yes. Um, so uh, the total travel distance is a similar formula, but with the floats. Okay. So we, we want to max minimize the total travel time, but we want. Uh, it would be nice to also make the total travel distance uh, large. But in fact, if if we have a given demand over a a, a, a time horizon. If a thousand vehicles are going to get in, then the total travel distance is going to be fixed over that time horizon. Okay, so this is our, our problem. Uh, we want to minimize the total travel time. I'm going to subtract some small bit of total travel distance, and this is for technical reasons only. Um, uh, in fact, our, our main goal is to minimize the total travel time. And we subject this to the ACTM, uh, flow and conservation, and also we can add that we, we'd like to keep the, the uh, on-ramp queues bounded, and um, our control must be within some bounds. So for example, uh, our, our metering rate uh, cannot be lower than some C under bar, which let's say if, if you say, one vehicle every 20 seconds, um, that's 180 vehicles per hour, uh, and you can't go lower than that because then people will start going through the red light. They, they're impatient, so, they, so you don't want this to be lower than 180, and this, you can't send vehicles more than every four seconds or so. So it's 900 vehicles per hour here. Excuse me, what, what is the function of this? Why we um, why is this guy present minus uh, eta? Yeah. Uh, what does what, this mean? Yes, this means almost nothing. <laughs> um, so so I, I I I said I sort of skimmed over that. I said it was uh, for technical reasons. Now um, you would like uh, it to appears have convex problem, yes, huh? convex optimization problems. Um, this so, is the reason. So this is in fact a uh, right now as it stands here. It's a non-convex problem. Non-convex. It's non-convex because this, this is an equality constraint, and this is non-linear, right? So, so in a convex uh, problem, your equality constraints have to be linear. So this is Equ ah, equality. This is equality, right? Equality. So, so, um, so this is non-convex. Uh, this is non-differentiable. Um, so, so, so this is the problem. Um, the reason eta comes in is that now I'm going to say, well, I'm going to give up on this problem for now. And I'm going to say, instead of searching on this line, I'm going to relax the problem and search everywhere below the line. Okay? And, and now this is, this becomes, when I relax these mins, these mins here, on the main line and the on-ramp, uh, this becomes a linear problem. Linear? Linear, in fact, yes, because I'm going to say that it's going. this is going to be less than this, this is going to be less than this, and this is going to be less than this. Uh -huh. And all of these are linear. See? And, and so uh, this becomes a linear problem. And then there's a, a, a proof that says under what conditions do I get when I solve this problem, a solution to this problem. And that um, proof requires a small eta here. That, that is, um, uh, that's the reason eta is there. But I don't go through the proof here. Um, so, this is the theorem I'm saying. Um, uh, if I solve L, that is the linear problem, I will get a solution to n whenever these conditions apply. These are sufficient conditions. Um, but uh, so the conditions, there are some, are sort of structural. D 
these V, the V and W, before we could say they could be up to one, inclusive, but in fact, they should be a little bit smaller than one. It's not a big deal. Um, the off-ramp split ratios should be constant in time. Uh, C under bar, the minimum metering rate should be zero. That means that any uh, ramp is allowed to shut down, to set the metering rate to zero. Uh, that, that must be there. Um, the final condition of the freeway is empty. Uh, uh, we are going to accomplish this by, at the end of our, our, our uh, time horizon, we are going to call it, uh, 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 add a cool down, cool down period. This cool down period, we turn off all of the demands and let the freeway empty out. Okay, so this is a condition. And then finally, the most important, sort of the most significant condition is this, that these, this R, this was the congestion term here, C n bar minus n, this term. Uh, this should be strictly less than that term. That means this min should take either this one or this one, but never this one. And what that means is that congestion should never propagate from the main line onto the ramps. Okay? And so this is the most stringent of the conditions, but in fact, I, 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 this, this almost never happens. I mean, almost never fails. Uh, so, so this is the theorem, and, and, and so this is a, a, an, an experiment, let's say. Um, we take 30 miles of I-210 in Pasadena, California, um, and this is what we call a speed contour map. Um, <coughs> this is a nice plot that shows uh, the gray is congestion, so gray is bad. Uh, traffic goes this way, and this is from 5 to 10 a.m. So you see, in the morning, all of a sudden, you start getting some congestion. Then this is a bottleneck. Then the congestion grows. Here also congestion grows, and there's more congestion, and then it dissipates in the, in the late morning. Um, if we apply now the optimization, you see here, at the end, we optimize over uh, five hours. But then we add this cool down period, an extra hour, where we turn all the demands off, and this ensures that we have this empty final condition at the end. Right? Um, and with no metering, so the integral of this curve, this is vehicles at every time, number of vehicles in, in the system. So the integral of this curve is our, is our cost function. Um, OK, if I. If I optimize and I say the queues can get as long as they want to get, I get I get this solution. And if now I restrict the queues to a, I think 50 vehicles, then I sacrifice a little bit. But this is the best possible solution. This is the best possible solution for ramp metering because this is a global optimum to the problem. Um, that's that's what I mean here by solution. I, I don't mean a local optimum, I, I mean the global one. Okay, this is uh, what, in, in our two cases, uh, with, without queue constraints and with queue constraints, what happened to congestion on the freeway? Okay, so if I allow uh, queues to get big, then I almost completely eliminate congestion on the freeway. I would predict that here, around here, there's an off-ramp. And so what this model is doing is saying, uh, let's avoid off-ramp blockage. That was our first inefficiency, right? And so probably it says, okay, I'll allow congestion here up, up until the off-ramp. The same here, perhaps, I don't know. Um, but you see what happens on the queues. These are the queues on the on-ramps. There's one that grows, there are about 750 vehicles on the on-ramp. So this is very unfair. Some people are waiting extremely long on, on the ramps. So, but when we uh, uh, say no on-ramp can have more than 50 vehicles, this spreads out the pain, right? And makes the, the controller work a lot harder 
uh, because, well, there's still going to be congestion on the freeway, but you see that the loss is not that big, from 7.7% reduction to only 6% reduction. <coughs> okay, so that's, that's prep metering. Any questions about this? Uh, so you, 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 you proposed uh, some kind of relaxation. This is a unique uh, way to relax uh, the problem, uh, to make it uh, attractable for computational point of view. Or you consider some others uh, relax This is the only one that I know of. Um, in, in fact, uh, the, the way this came about was we started doing with the CTM, and then when you relax the CTM, you run into problems. And fixing these problems, uh, the ACTM came out. Uh, the basic idea is uh, in changing the equality by inequality. Yes. And uh, uh, adding uh, some kind of relaxation in functional, minus eta TTD. This, this is not... Um, this is, is not uh, uh, a, a, a part of the relaxation itself. This, this was necessary for, so the relaxation works because you add the ADA, yes, that's right. Okay. And uh, the main problem is that the uh, equality constraints are, uh, are not a fine type. I mean, this is not linear. Right. And uh, if we use uh, the other approach that allows to work with a non-convex problem, uh, for example, uh, 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 Lagr uh, Lagrange uh, for penalty function, uh, um, Berserkas and so on. Uh, uh, this is not necessary, the initial problem uh, will be convex, but we uh, add a regularizer Yes. that uh, allows us to find some local ma minimum yes. and uh, in many situations this local minimum is main. Yeah, yeah, and I think um, uh, the, that, that is sort of, that is a, a standard, a good approach. It works best, I think, probably the, if the problem is differentiable so that you can um, find a, a local minimum I see. easy. For uh, yeah, and, but um, uh, here, uh, you know, in fact, what we uh, what we find is with a single linear same. problem, we can find the global optimum, mm -hmm. and we can we can certify that this is a global optimum uh, yeah. just by solving a linear problem. So, so uh, this won't work always. Of course, it's it's a huge luck, you know, that this works. It, it's not it's not really something that you you teach because it's not really. A, a technique, um, but but it's something to to try. And so we tried it again with this problem, uh, signal coordination on streets, and and again we got lucky. So okay. I'll get to that. Okay. So yeah. yeah. Okay. So next next problem. Um, you have now we're we're off the freeways. We're on streets. Right. You have a long street, and it's interrupted by cross streets. Okay, on these uh, on the intersection, we have a controller, and the controller normally operates in a cyclical way, right? And it goes through, let's say, for example, four stages. I call these stages, and in each stage, there are two movements. Okay, so uh, the first stage allows the, the the main arterial to go through movement. The second stage, the, the, the cross movements from the arterial onto the cross streets. Third stage is the cross street, fourth stage is again the cross street. In, in my formulation, I will not be concerned at all with the cross streets. I will only be concerned with optimizing the arterial. So I'm going to interpret this as being only one important stage that's green for the crop for the arterial and then red for for the arterial uh, in the other three stages. So I simplified to this. Okay. Um, let's take another example. 
uh, here you have four, four stages, but now the, the, the through movement is, appears in two stages for this one, and appears in two stages for this one. So here it's in one and two, and here it's in two and three. So there's some sort of overlap in two, and I have a nice green uh, for one direction in one, and the other direction in three. So uh, the representation would be like this. In general, I am going to say that I represent an intersection uh, by two movements. Each movement has a green phase, a single green phase per cycle, and a red phase, right? And this is cyclical. So a single green phase and then a red phase, okay? The green phase, I'll, uh, its length I'll call it G, and then I'll take, uh, these two are displaced, the midpoint of this with the midpoint of this is displaced by some distance delta. And that is fixed, these are three fixed given quantities uh, for each of the n intersections that I'm given. That's the geometric uh, uh, setup. <coughs> Oh, this, this doesn't look too great. Um, so this, this is akin to the congestion plot that we saw for freeways. Here, we call this a time-space diagram. Here, I, I'll put the, the uh, street vertically, and I have one row here for each cross street. And here, I have that same picture as before. This is the green interval, and th this is the green interval for the opposite direction, okay? And what you, what you should see here, but you don't see, is the, a band going like that in, in this direction. This represents vehicles going in time down at this speed through uh, these sh dark shaded, no, through the white, through the white rectangles. So the white rectangles are green times per vehicle going in this direction. So you have a band of vehicles that can go through every white rectangle, hit the white rectangle, and hit the white rectangle, and hit the white rectangle, okay? The largest band that can do this, we call the band width for the, let's say, inbound direction. Then there's a bandwidth for the outbound direction, which would be a band like this. I, I, I can't see it now, but it looks like it comes like this. This hits the shaded, shaded, goes like that, and, and it, so, the, so we have two bandwidths, one for outbound, one for inbound, and um, the sum of these two is what we call the bandwidth for this system. And the computer, it's... Uh, it's much clearer right there, yes. We have two bandwidths. Um, okay, so this this is actually the what we want to do is we want to uh, set these offsets so we can move. As I said before, we cannot change delta, and we cannot change the g. So we cannot change the shape. We can only move this shape back and forth. Each one of these shapes we can move back and forth. Right? And we want to set those so as to maximize the bandwidth. That's, that's the problem we want to solve. Um, this was one of the first problems uh, that was sort of treated mathematically in traffic way back in the you know, 60s or early 60s or so. And um, uh, the, 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 the solution, uh, the, uh, Finally, they, they came to a solution uh, which in, involved a mixed integer linear program. So integers, because there's a cycle here, and this band could go several cycles to get to another, another intersection, integers made their way into this problem. Um, and what we have suggested is that that was unnecessary. You don't need integers to solve this problem. In fact, you can solve it with with uh, continuous variables only. And to see that, um, let's do the following. Uh, so those of you who can see this, that's better. Um, but 
you take all of the dark shaded, the dark shaded are for uh, vehicles traveling in, in this direction, okay, this, these. And you translate all of those dark shaded squares along the, the, the trajectory and you, you gather them all here and you stack them up. Okay? And you do the same for these, for the uh, uh, light shaded in the other direction. You stack them up here. <coughs> so this is some sort of a transformation of the coordinate system. Okay? As we had in the original problem, we had this distance fixed. When I translate these down, this distance will, all, will be a different dif distance, it will also be fixed, and it will, it's something I can calculate. Uh, so, so the problem translates from this sort of, you know, crisscrossy uh, um, uh, picture to this picture which is rectified, and the bandwidth appears here as simply the intersection of all of these intervals. The intersection of all of these intervals is the bandwidth for this one. The intersection of all of these is the bandwidth for this one, and, and makes it very simple to compute the bandwidth once I do this transformation. Okay, um, it's kind of neat. You can you can think of this as a, a, a strange lamp. Okay, in this lamp, this problem is that this man um, wants to read the newspaper, and but has a lamp that works this way. Uh, it has two lights, um, and the light has to go through a series of sort of plates with with uh, with lenses, right? And these are so the, this distance is fixed, and so all you can do is move these rods, and what you want to do is maximize the light that you get out the other end. That's exactly equivalent to the to the bandwidth maximization problem for two ways, okay? Okay, so this is how it looks. Let's now uh, put some notation onto the problem. Um, you have n intersections. Say the i-th intersection we had g and g bar. This is that a uh, delta that we had, but through the transformation has become a new delta, but we know it and it's given. Um, this uh, uh, this green time, we're going to say that it's a function that is zero and it's a sort of step up a square uh, function. And for the, for, and we call that gamma. For each direction we have gammas, all of these gammas, right? To compute the bandwidth, all we do is we multiply all of these gammas and we integrate the result. And that is the bandwidth, right? That is the same as saying the, the intersection of all of intervals. Um, now, if we say now that these gammas are square, then this becomes this. This is the formula for computing the bandwidth for one direction as a function of the offsets. This, this gij is the average of uh, the green time for i and j. Okay? It's a very simple formula. And this uh, omega is the vector of all of the omegas. Okay. <coughs> so this is an explicit uh, function for the bandwidth. This is, and, and, and it is something that the, the previous theory had not arrived at because, of, because, uh, because it, it involved integers, so it became very complicated. But in fact, there is a very simple formula for this. Um, so I have the formula for the bandwidth for one direction and the bandwidth for the other direction. This is the same formula except it's displaced by these deltas, right? And this is what this would look like in, in two dimensions. Um, and so you have uh, a mi minimum of a bunch of planes. Oh, let, let, let's just take this one. A bunch of planes in I and J Right? This is this minimum. Uh, taking a maximum with zero, so that you have a floor. Right? And then when i and j are the same, then these are zero, 
So you get a minimum of all, and this is just GI, so you get the uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, a ceiling, okay, which is the smallest of all of the GIs is the ceiling. Okay, so the, it's some, something like a truncated uh, pyramid. And you have two of them, and looking at it from above, you have two of them, and they're displaced by delta. Delta is the vector of all of those deltas. So this is the basic geometry of, of, the, of the problem. And my problem now, my problem n, is to maximize the sum of these two. Okay? Um, you can see that how this is starting to look similar to, to that other problem, right? <coughs> Now, in comes relaxation. Uh, and we're going to say that we are going to remove the floor. So we're going to remove this max of the zero, and we're going to define uh, relaxed versions of these two that just, that just go down. And now these are concave, each of these are concave, so the sum of the two is concave. So our problem is concave, and in fact can be posed as a linear problem. Again, exactly the same way as before. Um, it's like lightning is struck twice, you know? <laughs> and so so we, we have, you know, uh, B is less than each and every one of, of the terms in this min. That's what I mean here. Uh, B, R is less than each and every one of the terms in the min, and so this is a linear problem. Okay. So does solving this problem solve our original problem? Uh, well, sometimes. Um, first of all, I I'll give the theorem next, but first of all we need a couple definitions. G star is going to be the highest of the two plateaus. I have two plateaus, G star is going to be the highest. What that represents is sort of the default solution. Um, if you can always uh, uh, coordinate in one direction and ignore the other direction. So I can always give sort of a green wave to one direction of travel and the other, well, forget about it. And so I would coordinate the, 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 the direction with the largest minimum green time. So I can always achieve this by just ignoring the other direction, okay? Um, so this is sort of a default solution. Uh, now, let will denote omega L star the solution to our linear problem, which we know, and omega N star the solution to our nonlinear problem, which we do not know. And this is the theorem. It says, well, omega N star is either omega L star if I confuse the notation here. This is the, the cost function evaluated on, uh, of the linear problem, evaluated on omega L star. So uh, that's this. Okay. So if, if I'm doing better than G star, then grab that solution. Otherwise, just grab this end solution here that gives me G star, which is either zero or delta. Okay. So it's very very simple. Um, so what does this mean? This means that if, see, there's, there's a, a zone of interference here, right? If in this zone of interference I can find a solution that is better than G star, then that, that solution will be given by omega L star. And, if, and if, uh, if there is no such solution here, then omega L star will be less than G star, and I can just grab G star. That's the solution. Okay, so, well, actually, the first picture I showed you was uh, an optimal solution. Uh, and here it is again. Um, this is an experiment that I did where I said, okay, I'm going to generate random uh, uh, streets uh, with randomly placed intersections with random uh, green times, so everything's random. <laughs> and I'll uh, generate some with two intersections, some with three, four, five, six, seven, eight intersections. And I'll solve it, and I'll see what sort of bandwidths I get. So, uh, and this is a whisker plot. I don't know how um, common this is here, but this plot sort of summarizes the distribution of solutions here. So this is the median. This is sort of within one sigma. 
and these are outliers, the, the furthest outliers. Okay? So in this solution, G star was 70. So I should always do better than 70. But if I have two intersections only, I can do a lot better than 70. More intersections I, I start putting in, it's like having more little rods on that light. You're going to get less and less light out the bottom. And, and once I get to about eight intersections, it is, a, it is only, these are outliers. You only have a few outliers that do any better than just coordinating one direction. So it's useless with eight intersections to try to coordinate both directions at the same time. You have to chop up the problem into, say, four and four. That's what this is saying. Okay. So th that, that is the thing that um, was recently published. <coughs> so now to extensions. And the nice thing about um, this theory is that uh, since it involves no integers, it, it is, there, it's only linear programming, there's a lot of stuff that can be done. It can be carried further. So already people have started um, uh, thinking of extensions. Um, the first one is that, remember before, we had, in, we had interpreted these gammas to be, oops, sorry, uh, squares, just squares. Now, uh, not necessarily so. Um, the gammas could be interpreted as being the probabilities of arrivals of vehicles to the intersection, and that can be measured. So what if uh, vehicles are arriving in sort of Gaussian platoons, right? Then you want to coordinate these Gaussian platoons. Um, and Gaussian would be some simple model of platoon dispersion. So it comes out as a square and then it sort of softens, right? Um, and that, is, that immediately sort of leads to an extension of the analogy uh, where the, the lights are now, they have varying transparency. And again, you want to maximize the light that comes out here. Um, you plug these uh, Gaussian functions into the formula for the bandwidth, and what you can show is that uh, if, if I multiply Gaussian functions and take the integral, the result is Gaussian. And uh, so the bandwidth as a function of omega, a vector, is a multidimensional Gaussian function, one centered at zero with some uh, variance and height gamma, and another one centered at delta with a different variance and a different height. Instead of a uh, uh, Gaussian function, you may uh, take uh, arbitrary uh, so-called Lepunov hat. I mean, okay. uh, uh, this is not necessarily... Uh, okay, so, so um, yes, there is a whole family of, of functions that could be plugged in here. And uh, um, I, I don't know in, in what cases I get something that is you know, manageable at the other end, but perhaps, yes, there's a large family of, of things you could do here. Um, the picture changes from this you know, squarish picture to now what I was saying before is that these are just Gaussian um, and, and separated by delta. Um, there is a, um, a result that says that if you have, um, if you're searching for the, the, the maximum in a Gaussian mixture, that uh, that maximum is to be found in the convex hull of the, uh, sort of the, 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 max, the, the, the maximums of each of the Gaussians. So, and so what that means is that here, I, I will find the maximum of the sum on this line segment. And so all I have to do is search the line segment, then I use Newton's method for that. And so a problem of any dimension, no matter how many uh, uh, intersections you have, it reduces to a line search in this case. And so we did the exact same experiment as before. Uh, in, in this case, you do not have this hard minimum uh, of 70, 
Um, but the you, you the more lenses you put, um, you the the light that comes out at the other end will be less dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer until you converge to zero. Okay, so this is a much smoother sort of process. Okay, so that's that's extension number one. Uh, the second um, uh, uh, distribution that we tried was, okay, Gaussian is not really correct because the support of the Gaussian is the whole real line, whereas here we're saying that this is cyclical, right? So if we take a cyclical Gaussian, this is called a von Mises uh, distribution and, and, and it's, it's, it's um, domain is the unit circle. Um, so this, this is actually a more natural distribution to use for this problem. And this is the form of it, Again, oh, in this case, uh, I, I, I came across some data, actually, of arrivals to an intersection. And this is uh, probability of arrival on, on the cycle. So this is, you know, 2 pi. And, and I can fit, I tried fitting Gau uh, von Mises mixtures to this. So the blue line here is one von Mises. Uh, the green is a sum of two von Mises, and so forth. And you can see that you can get, well, let's say with five, you get a very good fit to the data. And these are two separate, these are two different intersections. So, in fact, von Mises seems like a pretty good candidate for um, uh, fitting to real data, because it's cyclical. <coughs> Okay, so when I plug this guy into our formulas, uh, this is the problem that uh, we arrive at. It's not quite, kappa here was the variance parameter in von Mises. This is not quite as nice as the other ones. But um, one nice thing is that it has a nice <coughs> um, geometric interpretation, which is if I take rods, if I mean, you massage this a little bit and you, you, you get this. Uh, you take rods that uh, have length kappa and you attach them one after the other from one to n for one direction and one to n for the other direction. And then, I, th I'm sorry, I forgot to mention, I forgot to mention that this is a Bessel function. Okay. Um, so, so then I take some sort of string and I attach the first to the last, right? And I do that for both directions, first to last. And what I want to do is uh, uh, arrange these, these rods, I can arrange them however I want, so as to maximize this distance, okay? So while the solution is obvious, if I ignore this one, I can just stretch this all the way. And what that amounts to is all, making all of the omega zero or something like that. And that is the one, that is the solution for one direction only. But if I have two directions, now I have this constraint, which says that the angle between the first and the first rod is fixed. The angle between the second and the second rod is fixed. The angle between, so that, that, that really constrains what I can do. And this is the problem that must be solved for, for the von Mises case. Um, and, in fact, we haven't solved it yet. Okay, that's the, that's the second extension. <coughs> the third extension is to networks. Um, before we were talking only about uh, two directions, now let's say uh, our topology is not sort of this linear uh, arterial, but some general network. Um, instead of having only two paths, I'm going to allow n paths through this network. Um, at an intersection, we, we only had two greens, two movements. I'm going to say I have you know, many paths and m many movements through an intersection. Um, before, uh, the two paths encountered every intersection. But in the general case, not every path will go through every intersection. Okay, That's the difference. And uh, the, the first, one, the, the easy one was solvable with the linear program, but the general case is not solvable with the linear program. So how does this work? 
is mostly just uh, extending the notation. Um, so now we have a network with a path. This is one path, this is another path. Um, a path is a sequence of movements. So this, this path goes through this straight movement, this right turn movement, this right turn movement, this left turn movement. This path also goes through this left turn movement. So a, a two different paths can use the same movement. right? Um, but a path goes through a sequence of movements at MP. Um, the offsets are now defined per path and per movement. So I have two separate offsets uh, for the same movement at this intersection. One for this path, and one for this path, and I'm going to have to constrain them so that they actually represent the same physical thing. Um, and and so, so uh, this is this, the formula for the bandwidth for a path P. This is analogous to the previous formula with the min. It looked uh, very similar, um, um, except this is, this is a generalization because it's over MP and not, not over IJ. Okay. This G is, again, the, the average of the green time for movement M prime and movement M double prime. So this is the same thing, just a more general notation. Um, however, I'm going to have to add another constraint, constraint, which, without getting too much into this, is saying that I have two separate variables, uh, these two, that are both representing the movement that is this left turn. Okay? And I'm going to have to make sure that those end up being the same thing, uh, representing the same physical variable. So this, that's this constraint, and it's a linear constraint. So I won't explain this too much. Um, this t is the travel time along this path up to this intersection and along the other path up to this intersection. So this is uh, akin to what we did before uh, moving the, the, the green times along these, uh, these uh, trajectories to a, a common point. Now we move them all via their travel time to their to their uh, starting point. <coughs> so, um, that said, the optimization problem is now a little bit bigger. We have many paths, so we have many of these little you know, figures. It would look something like this. One per path, right, instead of just two. And, and so we, we're going to find the maximum uh, we're going to weight it by each, each one, we're going to weight it by P, before we had said that these the WPs were one. But now we're going to allow that we weight each one differently. Um, and we have to add here these internal offset constraints, which, which were these. These did not appear in the previous problem. Um, so, So how do we generalize the pre what what is what does the previous the Knight's nice theorem look like here? Um, well, what you have to do is if I define P as the set of all paths, P star is the set of all subsets of P. So this is any selection that I make of these. So you know I make any selection of paths, right? Each element of P star is a selection of paths. So let's take one selection U of paths, and we can define the relaxed linear problem. Before, we had defined it with the two, now we're going to uh, say we have a whole family of linear problems, one for each possible selection of paths. Okay. Um, now what does the theorem say? It says that this, if, if I solve all of, those, uh, of that whole family of problems uh, for each selection of paths, and I find the best solution in that whole family, that is the solution to my nonlinear problem. So that, that, that's you know, a starting point. Maybe not too helpful, but I, because it's a lot, a lot to solve, um, but that's the starting point. So we have gone from a nonlinear program to a family of linear programs. And we would have to solve every single one, but this family grows exponentially, so it's not, it's not good. 
Um, but we're going to, you know, do a couple more steps. It might make it a little bit better. So the first step is we're going to turn this into a mixed nonlinear program uh, by adding uh, this variable alpha p, which is uh, a zero one variable. It's a binary, and it basically tells me uh, for each path whether I should include it or not in the selection, right? And so I, I add one of those, and, and so I, with, with this in there, the, the program will, will select the alpha p's and it will select uh, in the final best solution which ones I should have selected. So I've, I've reduced uh, this family into a single mixed nonlinear program. It's still nonlinear. Okay, so that's that. Um, and to go from a mixed nonlinear program to a mixed, mixed linear program, we found you know, a, a nice little result that's due to uh, Fred Glover from 1975, <coughs> which notes that um, you can, if, if you have a constraint of, th of this form, and you can bound this guy, then you can add a, a variable representing this, so we call that k, rep represents this, and I know that k will be between 0 and 2c, um, I, I, can, I can say that, and then uh, if, if that's possible, then this problem will be equivalent to this problem, where I've added a couple um, uh, uh, inequality constraints. Okay, this is sort of just a, a, a technical thing. It, you can do this. It, it increases the size of the problem, but it makes it linear. So this is where this ends. Um, uh, we have a mixed linear program. We haven't really uh, solved many cases of it, so we don't know exactly how useful it is. But, um, <coughs> but well, uh, it does solve, um, you know, n uh, network bandwidth problem, which is, which, which may yield some useful information. Okay, so I've reached the end of the talk, and um, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if there are any questions. That, uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> questions? It is possible to get a presentation to look through it at home. To show where? It is possible to get your presentation, please. Yes, yes, I'm leaving it on this desktop, and if you give me your email, or I can send it to Yaroslav, or some, I, I don't, um, and, and, yeah, it's totally available. Because it's very interesting, but... Yeah. Don't worry about it. Yeah, okay. there, there are videos, and yeah, when you split your nonlinear problem on mixed linear problem, is that means if I look on the transportation graph, that means you split your graph on the some subgraphs like this. Oh, is is the idea close to you? I think it might be. So it's not a per graph per you know. It's not on the graph. It's per path. I understand? Yes. It's per path. But paths so, also can be uh, represented by graphs. That I see. I see. So maybe there is some transformation there that um, maybe. Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe I you just split all possible waves of your graphs on some certain paths. Yeah, like separate sub graphs of this total graph. It, it, it might be. It might be true. Uh, um, so, you know, I think it, it will be interesting to see uh, what these alpha p's give us, yes. and and how this can be interpreted. Because yes. this is telling us focus your energies on these paths and not on these other paths, right? And, and maybe that can be used as information to, well, adjust the greens or, or something like that. Like to, um, another thing that I didn't talk very much about is this W, which the, the intent here is that the W should, uh, should be some sort of proxy for flow, mm -hmm. right? So the, this is where the traffic data would come in. Um, you, you have some paths that you know that they have lots of vehicles on them, so you want to uh, put more emphasis on these, right? And make sure that, that they're getting a, a good bandwidth. 
and you uh, take into account what you know on each path exactly the density and velocity of traffic flow. Yes. That means your detectors works well. That's right. Okay. Yeah, you, you have some some notion, some real time notion of who's using the how many people want to use the path, mm -hmm. right? And and the interesting information that will come out of here is, <coughs> um, so for example, uh, uh, back to your 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 question, which mm -hmm. is. Um, well, if I, if I have paths that are completely non-intersecting, mm -hmm. right, then there's no conflict yes, between them. Exactly. And, and so I can, I can optimize both at the same time, yes. right? And so if one can separate the network into sort of yes. paths that, that are non-conflicting... We have optimization problem when our paths are have cross-section. Yes. When and then there may be conflicts. Yes, right? then we have yes. conflicts. Yes, so th this is a, an interesting thing that could be looked at from a topological um, perspective. Yeah. There are no two various uh, paths from one path point to one. There are only one path point. Uh, no, you could, have, you could have multiple. There's no uh, notion of OD here. So you can, you can have multiple paths from one same origin. I mean, there's no con restriction here for that. Well, any more question? So let's thanks uh, speaker Thank you again. Thank you very much.